Now today I'm going to discuss an area of research that we've been interested in for several years, that of using vitamin C as a potential anti-cancer agent. Let me first summarize what I think are the major accomplishments and then I'll discuss them in more detail. First, we've demonstrated that vitamin C is toxic to tumor cells at levels that are achievable clinically. We've further developed a method to increase the efficacy of vitamin C against tumors by using an antioxidant called lipoic acid. We've demonstrated that vitamin C can be administered intravenously at sustained doses of at least 50 grams per day over an eight-week period without causing renal complications or significant alterations in blood chemistry parameters. We've obtained some evidence recently that vitamin C supplementation improves some parameters of immune cell function. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we've been able to successfully improve the condition of several cancer patients, some of whom are with us today, through the use of intravenous vitamin C or a combination of intravenous vitamin C with other antioxidants or immune stimulating agents. Now, vitamin C is an interesting nutrient. It has several interesting chemical and biological properties. Vitamin C is one of the major water-soluble antioxidants in our body, and under certain conditions, it can also have pro-oxidant functions. I'll discuss the importance of this in relation to cancer in a little while. It has several biological functions that are of potential interest to people with cancer. First of all, it plays a role in maintaining proper performance of the immune system. Since cancer patients are often both deficient in vitamin C and often have depressed immune systems, this has made supplementation an attractive idea to many. Vitamin C is also necessary for the production of collagen, which is an essential extracellular matrix material. This has led some scientists to speculate that we can use vitamin C to strengthen our extracellular matrix and wall in the tumors to prevent them from spreading. And vitamin C is also involved with carnitine synthesis. The deficiency in this is important in a condition called cachexia, which many cancer patients suffer through. So for these and for other reasons, vitamin C is becoming more and more popular as a nutritional supplement among cancer patients. There are some interesting issues related to the supply and demand of vitamin C in cancer patients. We have found, as have other researchers, that cancer patients are often deficient in vitamin C. In fact, in one study we did, we found 14 out of 22 patients had levels that we would consider way below normal. Also, vitamins, there are evidence that suggests that vitamin C accumulates in tumors at higher concentrations than in surrounding tissue. And this might partially explain why cancer patients are, have low vitamin C levels in their blood. Also, we found that if you give intravenous vitamin C infusions to cancer patients, they end up getting less vitamin C in their plasma than healthy adults do. Some experiments we performed are shown here where we gave 15 grams intravenously and measured the plasma vitamin C level immediately after. We found that cancer patients had roughly half the vitamin C in their blood that healthy adults do. This leads us to believe again that cancer patients have some metabolic or tissue demand from vitamin, for vitamin C that healthy adults don't. There are some concerns and misconceptions about vitamin C. Because it's an antioxidant, there are fears by some scientists that vitamin C supplementation will reduce the efficiency of chemotherapy, that it might protect tumors from the oxidative damage that chemotherapeutic agents produce. Also, there is a widespread belief that vitamin C is ineffective based on two clinical trials using low-dose oral supplementation. And there is, seems to be a widespread misconception among medical practitioners that giving high doses of vitamin C will cause acute kidney damage. These are perceptions more than they are truths. And in fact, at the RECNAC project, we've generated quite a bit of data to challenge all of these notions. First of all, we found that vitamin C is toxic to tumor cells at sufficient doses. We've shown under some, we have data to suggest that under some circumstances it can actually improve the effects of chemotherapy. We have demonstrated that vitamin C is efficient in treating cancer, as several patients can, of ours can attest to. And finally, we've shown that high vitamin C doses can be given without causing kidney problems. The way vitamin C kills cancer is through what's called pro-oxidant functions. Now, I'll give you a little quick chemistry lesson here. The way vitamin C usually gets rid of free radicals and other oxidants is that it donates hydrogen atoms, which converts these free radicals into less harmful substances. One important substance is hydrogen peroxide. 
Normally, hydrogen peroxide is not a problem for us because our cells contain enzymes called catalase that allow it to be converted to water. However, tumor cells have less catalase than normal cells. So if we give enough vitamin C, we can build up hydrogen peroxide in tumors, and this will damage and eventually kill the tumor cells. We tested this out in our laboratories using a three-dimensional tumor model. What we did was we grew colon cancer cells inside of small cylindrical tubes. These form cylindrical miniature tumors that in a lot of ways mimic solid tumors in the body. And what we found with this tumor model is that as we gave higher and higher doses of vitamin C, the percentage of healthy cells, percentage of viable cells shown in blue steadily decreased, while the percentage of dead and dying cells shown in red and green steadily increased. We found that doses of roughly 200 milligram per deciliter were needed to kill a significant number of tumor cells. One of our aims was to find ways to lower this dose. In other words, find ways to make vitamin C effective at lower concentrations. The way we did this is we did several studies looking at combinations of vitamin C with other antioxidants and nutrients. We had several good leads, including vitamin K3 as being helpful in combination with vitamin C. But one of the ones we got most excited about was lipoic acid. Lipoic acid is an antioxidant that is lipid soluble but can also be made to be water soluble. We believe it helps to regenerate vitamin C and indeed our data show that it improves the efficacy of vitamin C against tumor cells. This graph here is what's called a survival curve. It gives you the fraction of tumor cells that survive a treatment versus the concentration of the vitamin C we're using. If you look at vitamin C alone, which is shown in the black, as you get to concentrations between 200 and 500 milligram per deciliter, you're starting to see a decrease in tumor cell survival. The key note I want to make is that when you add lipoic acid along with vitamin C, you see this decrease in survival at a much lower concentration. In fact, at doses between 30 and 90 milligrams per deciliter, we can kill a substantial portion of tumor cells within two days. As I'm going to show you, we can actually attain these doses in the plasma of patients through intravenous infusions. We were also interested in learning how vitamin C affected chemotherapy. What we did is we did experiments combining vitamin C with a standard therapeutic agent, adriamycin, which some of you have probably heard of if you've known anyone who's had cancer. This is a standardly used molecule. Now, data here at an adriamycin concentration of 10 micrograms per liter shows that the drug by itself killed about 8% of the tumor cells we exposed it to. When we added 5 milligrams per deciliter of vitamin C, there was actually a protective effect where the vitamin C was protecting the cells from the damage that the chemotherapeutic agent would do. This wasn't the whole story, though, because as we increased the vitamin C dose further, we started seeing cell killing above and beyond what you'd get with the adriamycin alone. So what's happening here is that at low doses, vitamin C acts as an antioxidant and it protects cells from oxidants such as producing drugs such as adriamycin. On the other hand, when you give high enough doses of vitamin C that it can act as a pro-oxidant, then it actually enhances the cell killing of adriamycin. Now this is of interest to us because of the reports that tumors collect vitamin C at higher doses than normal tissues. We're looking into the idea of perhaps a best of both worlds scenario where we can give vitamin C and systemically protect from side effects of adriamycin while concentrating enough of it in the tumor to enhance the cell killing. Question was, how much vitamin C can we actually get in the blood through an intravenous infusion? To test this, we had a volunteer who we gave 60 grams of intravenous vitamin C for an 80-minute period, and we measured the plasma concentrations as a function of time. We, we, you can see that we got quite high concentrations initially, and then they steadily decrease as the vitamin C is used out throughout the body. We used these data to, with a mathematical model to try to predict what kind of plasma levels we could get with various intravenous doses of vitamin C. And what I want to point out is that when you look at doses of 50, 100 grams per day, we can get average plasma concentrations that are in that range that we needed to kill tumor cells. So this demonstrates to us that the idea of killing tumor cells with vitamin C is feasible. 
The question is, is it safe? In our hands, it has been very safe. We've given people 100 grams per of vitamin C and have seen no adverse effects, but we want to verify this in terminal cancer patients. So we funded a research project at the University of Nebraska where they gave 24 terminal cancer patients continuous intravenous infusions of 10 to 50 grams per day for an eight-week period. This caused them to reach plasma ascorbate levels that were on the average of 20 milligrams per deciliter. The main finding was that this treatment proved safe. There were a few adverse ev events and they generally were not attributable to the vitamin C. These were very sick people. Uh, the white blood count cell counts remained stable. Hemoglobin levels decreased slightly, but this was consistent with trends observed before the treatment began. Because there was such concern about vitamin C's effect on kidneys, we focused on three blood chemistry parameters that are predictors of kidney function, blood urea nitrogen, creatinine, and uric acid. The main point about these parameters is if a patient is undergoing acute kidney disease, the blood levels of these three substances will rise quite a bit. What we found instead with the vitamin C is they either kept stable within the normal range or in the case of uric acid, they decreased quite a bit. From this, we're able to conclude that the vitamin C treatment was not causing acute kidney disease. We've recently gathered some data showing the effect of vitamin C on immune cell function. What we did was we took blood samples from healthy volunteers and we isolated two kinds of white blood cells. Uh, one kind called a phagocyte, which is responsible for digesting in bacterias, and another called a lymphocyte, which proliferate and multiply in order to mount an re immune response. We wanted to see how these cells performed in laboratory tests. For the cells that digest bacteria, we found that their performance decreased with the age of the donor. In other words, when we got cells from older donors, they didn't perform as well as in younger donors. However, we noticed that when we had donors who supplemented a vitamin C, the effect of age was much less severe than if they did not. So here's some evidence that vitamin C supplementation slows down the decrease in immune function that normally occurs with age. We found a similar thing to do, we found a similar thing with lymphocytes. Here the percent of lymphocytes that were able to proliferate in our laboratory test decreased sharply as the age of the donor increased. But at any given age, cells from donors who supplemented with vitamin C performed quite a bit better than cells from donors who did not. And we can prove statistically that all these things are significant and so forth. Another interesting thing about this experiment is adding vitamin C during the test did not have an, an effect. So the benefits of vitamin C were probably systemic and long term. Our data lead us to two possible strategies for using vitamin C to help cancer patients. The first is to provide what's called an adjuvant dose, meaning that vitamins, cancer patients are often deficient in vitamin C, supply just enough vitamin C to replenish their tissue stores. This might restore immune function, improve patient well-being, and may also reduce the side effects associated with chemotherapy. Another approach is since we have found that vitamin C can kill cancer cells at high enough doses, is to go ahead and give a dose high enough to induce tumor cell killing. Here we can take advantage of the preferential toxicity of vitamin C towards tumor cells and the preferential accumulation of vitamin C in tumors. And these can be used in combinations with other antioxidants and other therapeutic agents, including the immune therapy ideas that Neil Reardon is going to talk about a little later on. So let me summarize by again listing what we feel are the major accomplishments of our vitamin C research. We've shown that vitamin C is toxic to tumor cells at clinically achievable doses. We've shown that when you combine vitamin C with lipoic acid, it is even more effective. We've demonstrated the safety of intravenous vitamin C infusions of at least 50 grams per day over an eight-week period. We've obtained some evidence that vitamin C supplementation improves immune cell performance. And finally, we have successfully include, improved the conditions of several cancer patients through the use of intravenous vitamin C or vitamin C in combination with other treatments.